Good evening, Americans. This is your favorite alien. On Monday, September 6, 2021, here at the activities room of the Springs of Park Hill, Orange City, Florida. Sitting in for Paul Harvey this evening. Stand by for commentary. Well, Mr. Harvey, if you're upstairs with the boss, uh, I want to do a commentary about the American Republic and the American people. And you've been trying to do this since I first started seeing your reports back in the 60s till your death in 2009. And unfortunately, it fell on deaf ears. You tried everything under the sun to get these Americans to look at themselves. And they have not done it. And when you died, the Afghan war was almost a decade old. Here it is, ended after another decade. So 20 years, Mr. Harvey... And the Americans have the same stupid rhetoric they had back in September 11, 2001. The same stupid way of thinking, the same stupid way of talking, and no brains, they still got their watermelons there. As you've been trying to tell them, Mr. Harvey, the Americans have always been a people of extremes. And the best way to describe it is the extremes in the 20th century. After World War I, they went extremist isolationist. Or as Mr. Warren G. Harding put it about 100 years ago, <clears throat> return to normalcy. But see, just like the next war, when they ended World War I, they were a country that was developing itself with all these technologies that they were coming across ever since 1876. The Europeans, well, they developed some technology too, but not to the level to the Americans. And they were all exhausted and bankrupt at the end of 1918, especially the British and the French. But they had their colonial empires, so they were still getting raw materials that they needed. But as far as economic powers, uh, well, they never got to the level they were before 1914 because uh, they were just so down and out. So the period between the two world wars including the crash of 1929, which devastated them even further, okay? The United States seems to be extremists because they were isolationists all the way up to, and including the Depression. Roosevelt, on the other hand, didn't want them to be isolationists because he thought, oh, we'll get involved in another war. Because during the Depression, you had governments falling all over the place, like Germany in 1993, or 1923, pardon me, almost 100 years ago. The economy got so bad in Germany that uh, the Weimar Republic, as it was called then, you had people with wheelbarrows full of German marks. And they couldn't buy a loaf of bread, not even a single heel of bread, with a wheelbarrow full of German marks. That's how bad the economy was for most European countries in 1923. And this was before the crash actually happened in America. But then again, you Americans were supplying everything to the Europeans. And we're living high on a hog, and you decided to invent something called 
hey, I will invest this, but I only pay a dime on the dollar, and we'll sell. Well, yeah. When it gets big, I'll sell, and I'll make the money up that way. Well, the only problem is, when you're the only game in town, and the other people suffer economic reversions like they did in the 1920s in Germany, France, Italy, which came back to haunt them because Italy became Mussolini in 1922 after that disastrous end of World War I for them. And they were on the winning side, mind you. Japan, the same thing. They ended up on the winning side with the Allies and disastrous economic conditions, which caused them to become a military, militaristic country. Especially when Hirohito took over in 1926. And this goes to my thing, Americans, about 9-11 and five days, that you guys didn't learn your lesson. And I'll talk more about a 9-11 when it comes in. But this is what it is. This is what started 9-11. The extremism that you guys have developed in the early 20th century. You went from extremist isolationist and the Europeans, uh, because of their own stupid allies and alliances, which you guys didn't see happen, cost them World War I. And the French and the British didn't learn their lesson with Poland. It cost them World War II. Okay? When Roosevelt took over, he decided to end the isolationist and started to do lent lease even before the World War II started with the British and the French. Because he knew it was coming down the pike because Mr. Uh, Adolf Hitler and Mussolini well Mussolini you know he was trying to get Ethiopia he already had Libya but he was trying to get Ethiopia <laughs> he had never did get it uh, but Libya was a tenuous hold if ever there was one by the Italians came back to haunt them in World War II uh, and you Americans, well, I should say the Roosevelt administration, went from the isolationist Americans to underhanded Richard Nixon stuff with the Europeans uh, and propped up the British economy. Now, the British economy had suffered drastically during World War I. And they can deny it all they want, but they were in trouble. They were bankrupt. Same with the French. The French decided to, hey, let's take over the Ruhr over in Germany in 1923. Yeah. After they made Germany sign that disastrous uh Treaty of Versailles in 1919, oh, in that uh, car, railroad car. And Hitler took advantage of it. It came back to haunt the French because he made them sign a disgusting treaty of surrender in 1940 on that same car. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean? And you Americans over here were having a time of your lives because by the late 1930s, you still had depression. You still hadn't got out of the things. Uh, but what got you out was World War II, where Roosevelt decided, okay, all you industries are going to serve war efforts. No more cars are going to be built. No more chocolates are going to be made. No more of this is going to be made. No more of that's going to be made. And everything goes over there. And you had rationing, which you, the present generation, don't understand that. You could only buy so much in a week. 
You could only go so much in a week. You couldn't buy any gas, rubber. They couldn't buy much many tires because there was no rubber to be had. And artificial rubber was a decade away. Yeah. Hmm. Well. But you still had technologies coming in during that time. Radar. Television. Oh, yeah. Remember? 1939 Wells Fair. Yeah. Mm hmm. All this played a part in World War II. And you had a little company named Bantam who was developing this little vehicle which became the Jeep. So by the end of World War II, you guys again were the only standing untouched power. No bankruptcy, no nothing. You guys were it. For the next 30 years, you guys were it. But you went to the other extreme. Instead of isolationist in 1919, you guys in 1945 went uh, to extremists. We got to intervene in everything because we don't want to have another Third World War. We don't want to fight the Russians. And, you know, we got our friends in China. I don't know how come the Roosevelt slash Truman administration thought that China was going to be it for them. Chiang Kai-shek was a disaster. Yet they treated China like it was a power. Where did they do that from? I have no idea. I'm still scratching my head trying to understand that. But for the next 70 years, that's a legacy that you had. Intervention and it's come back to haunt you. It costs 9-11. Sure, the terrorist attacked the towers in 9-11. But some of the blood is yours because of the way you acted that cost 9-11. You intervene in other people's affairs. You intervene in Saudi Arabia's affair with Saddam Hussein. Uh, there's no way Saddam Hussein could have, could have invaded Saudi Arabia because there's too much country there, there's too much desert, and he didn't have the people to do it. He had enough of Kuwait. And you guys didn't understand that. But because Kuwait had oil, and it was a former British protectorate, which they created Kuwait and put the Al, Al Sabah people in there in the 1760s. <laughs> See what I mean? It's thinking like that that's cost you lives, Americans. 90 million lives in World War II were cost by thinking like that. 90 million. And look at all the millions that have cost since World War II. All over the place. You guys have bled, what? 58,000, 38,000, uh, and a couple 10,000 or so if you add the rest of them. So you guys have bled over 100,000, that's all you say. And don't forget about the uh, people that the terrorists have attacked, including the 3,000 from 9-11. And why? Because you decided that war was going to be clean and political. War has never been clean, and war has never been political. War is only happens for two things. Somebody wants to destroy you, and you want to survive. That's the only reason you got war. And it's total war. So if you guys, when you attacked Afghanistan in 2001, you know what the outcome was. Same as when you attacked the North Vietnamese in 1964 with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Oh, boy. <laughs> You guys knew what the outcome was going to be. Disastrous on both ends. You can go in there, yeah, but the idea is how you're going to get out. You didn't know how to get out of Vietnam. And I would have thought that you would have learned your lesson and figure out if we go into Afghanistan like we did in Vietnam, how are we going to get out? Yeah? Well, 
Nixon negotiated a treaty with North Vietnam. And the North Vietnamese knew they had something like the Taliban knew they had something. Time, which the Americans didn't have. You never have time because you don't like time. So they did that treaty in 1973. And you didn't take the hint. Oh, well, South Vietnam's going to be a country of itself, and it's going to defend itself. Really? When the North Vietnamese attacked in late uh, 1st of April, in 30 days, they captured all of South Vietnam. With all the equipment you left the South Vietnamese, and remember, you had 14 years that you had the South Vietnamese army, just like you said you had 20 years with the Afghan army. <coughs> Same thing happened there, didn't it? So when are you Americans going to realize you went from one extreme to the other and it's cost you lives and treasure? And why did you go and take your families over to Afghanistan, which it's a war zone. It's supposed to be. Not a zone where you take your family members. You guys don't read your history too well, huh? April 12, 1861. The Battle of Bull Run. Remember that? People in the north side, they packed their lunches and dinner and parasols and chairs and were over there watching the war. Unbeknownst that uh, the South didn't care if you were there. They were shooting at you. You don't remember that? They didn't teach you that in high school, people? Really? So it's about time that you look at yourselves, look at your leaders, and look at your country and say, what the heck are we doing for the last 70 years? It cost us lives. Why? Sitting in for Paul Harvey and Mr. Harvey upstairs, I know you're a devout American patriot. But it's time that we talk to them as they should be talked to. Because they got to make a decision now. They only got 44 years left, a little under 44 years left. And right now, they got a decision to make with jo uh, Joseph Biden. Because look at that. What is the United States? What is it to be a United States citizen? Con states like Texas are messing up. The citizenship, you're supposed to be a federation member of the United States. So they're United States citizens, federation citizens, not Texans. And a state is limiting their freedoms. Really? Do you understand what you're doing, Texas? Or Republicans? It's not a question of anti-abortion and pro-abortion. Forget about that. It's a question of, do you understand what you're doing? So as I said, sitting in for Paul Harvey, this is your favorite alien. Would you guys get your watermelons off your brains before you lose your country? Good day.